Faith is a curious thing. It is utterly intangible, unmoored in many ways from the rules that govern the terraqueous universe we inhabit, and yet its acts can be reflected in both this world and the one that lies alongside it. Hold on to an idea with enough conviction, and you begin to shape the world around you, as the tides of the nether space between worlds listen to your prayers with hungry intent. The old adage that through faith all things are possible is a very tangible reality in this world of ours. If you are terrified by that prospect, then good. It just proves that you are still sound of mind. While the theological and cosmological impacts of that must wait until a further date for me to elucidate upon, faith is the central reason for the existence of the subjects of this record. They are a product of it, created in the fires of one of the Imperium's worst doctrinal civil wars, and molded by its aftermath. They are the linchpin of it, the God Emperor's most devout servants, paragons for those of us down here in the mundanity to aspire to. They are the bringers of it, the soldiers of belief, taking the light of the Golden Throne to all who need it, and the fires of his most perfect abjuration to those who would deny him upon Terra. For faith is not with out one to act upon it. It is not simply enough that one can just believe. One must transform this into works. Salvation must be earned. The universe is unkind, and though the Emperor protects, the Emperor also demands. He demands obedience. He demands fealty. He demands action. Through the delivery of faith, through feats of heroism, courage, and sacrifice, is the world changed? Is the universe bent to the will of the One? And through this, miracles. There are none better equipped to do so, none more self-sacrificing, none more faithful, than those of the Holy Orders. Know then that this is a record of the bearers of the Imperial Creed, the truest soldiery of the God Emperor of Humanity, the Sisters of Battle, of the Adepta Sororitas. The Adepta Sororitas, commonly known throughout the Imperium as the Sisters of Battle, are the militant wing of the Adeptus Ministorum, or Ecclesiarchy. An often monastic, all-female division, they are in aspect superficially similar to the Space Marines of the Adeptus Astartes, but vastly different in many other ways. While the missionaries, confessors, priests, and cardinals of the Ecclesiarchy are responsible for the spreading and cultivation of the faith in the God Emperor of Mankind, it is to the sisters that the responsibility of ensuring its purity falls. As such, they are not mere itinerant preachers delivering sermons to the unenlightened, nor are they warders of a cathedral set to guard the devout. No. The sororitas are to be ever tasked with the fulsome annihilation of the faithless and the accursed, the lost and the damned, to bring ruin most divine to those whose word or act would sully the sanctity of the imperial creed. It is not for naught that their conflicts are known as wars of faith, for this devotion is the linchpin of their blessed work, and indeed the reason for their very existence. The orders of the Sisterhood wage campaigns of extermination, purgation engagements to scour the Emperor's domains of the impure, and to re-sanctify that which may have suffered the taint of heresy. To the Sisters, they act as the white blood cells of the body of the God Emperor, his holy Imperium, and in their defense of the realm, they find their ultimate work. The origins of the Adepta Sororitas lie in the blood and battle and fire of an inter conflict of millennia past that once threatened to rend the Imperium in twain, the Age of Apostasy. 
when a full record of the dark chapter of the Imperium's history that it represents will be forthcoming, the origins of the Sisterhood are so deeply intertwined with it that a summary must be related herein. It began in the 36th millennium with the sundering of the High Lords of Terra, the highest civilian authority in the Empire, by the then master of the administratum, Goge van Dyer. Utilizing all the political power his position granted him, both overt and covert, legal and utterly illegal, Van Dyer manipulated his way into seizing the position of High Ecclesiarch of the Ministorum, the first time any one soul in Imperial history had held two seats on the Council of the High Twelve simultaneously. When the Fabricator General of the Abdeptus Mechanicus raised a protest at this unseemly concentration of power, Van Dyer seized full authority of the Senatorum Imperialis, dissolving the High Lords and ushering in his tyrannical reign of blood. It was a time wherein countless billions died from civil strife, breakdown of law and order, widespread famines, and Van Dyer's own increasingly psychotic purges. He was, however, far from inept. One does not usurp the greatest authority in the Imperium without being supremely good at what one does, and the might of the forces of the tyrant were wielded with heavy-handed power. Amongst them was a curious cult known as the Daughters of the Emperor. Originally a small agrarian sect from the world of San Lior, their devotion and martial prowess were noted by the spies of Van Dyer, who, ever interested in harnessing the power of the faithful, he was head of the ecclesiarchy after all, travelled personally to the world. When his greetings were rebuked, with the daughters exclaiming him no true emissary of the god emperor, Van Dyer had one of his outraged retinue shoot him with their sidearm, a golden halo of light exploding around him and deflecting the projectile in front of the stunned sisterhood. The canny Van Dyer had guessed quite correctly that their aggressive agri-world the daughters were from would never have seen something so, to him, as commonplace as a personal refractor field. He had guessed quite correctly. From that day forth, the daughters of the Emperor were the tyrant's most devoted spear, to be cast forth at any who opposed him and bring unto them utter ruin. He heaped upon them weapons and armor, equipment of the finest quality, and in turn they cut down every enemy he bade them to, both from within and from without. Even when the ecclesiarchy itself conspired to depose him, worrisome over the growing instability they perceived in the de facto ruler of the Imperium, the daughters of the Emperor marched into the Cathedral of the Emperor Deified, and emerged with the heads of every single member of the Holy Synod. All was not well abroad across the stars, and as the death toll mounted, as world after world burned in the fires of Van Dyer's madness, as the enemies of the Imperium gathered to pluck its weakening body apart, a sect calling themselves the Confederation of Light emerged to oppose the tyrant. Led by one Sebastian Thor, and driven by this man's peerless authority, its forces grew and grew as more and more sought to throw off the yoke of lunatic oppression. Only when whole chapters of the Adeptus Astartes and macroclades of the Adeptus Mechanicus also pledged themselves to Thor's banner did the final and peerless imperial military authority take note. The Adeptus Custodes. With the support of the Emperor's own life wards assured, the Imperial Palace upon Terra now lay besieged, with Thorian forces planning its assault in order to forcibly remove the by then utterly insane Van Dyer. While the continental-sized palace lay under siege, a custodes strike sodality moved upon the tyrant, attempting to end the conflict there and then and saving uncountable lives in the process. Outside Van Dyer's chambers, they are confronted by six members of the Daughters of the Emperor, bellowing at the Emperor's bodyguards to come no closer, lest they be fired upon. Seeing such clear pain in the eyes of the Daughters, that their faith between defending the head of the Imperial Church and of threatening the incarnations of the Imperial household itself was tearing them asunder, 
the lead custodian laid down his guardian spear, pleading to be heard, for them to step aside that they may end decades of senseless bloodshed. The leader of the daughters, named Alicia Dominica, refused, and the custodes, seeing but one way forward, bade them to follow and behold what none but they and the Emperor's own sons had seen in six millennia, the ultimate center of the Imperial Palace, the throne room itself. What transpired therein was never recorded, for nothing within the very chamber of the Golden Throne itself ever is. But what emerged were women changed, bathed now in the righteous light of those who had been shown how deeply they had been manipulated and controlled. Alicia Dominica and her sisters entered the chamber of the High Lord himself, who, upon seeing them, launched into a maddened tirade about traitors and usurpers, spittle flying from his discoloured face as he reeled off the names of those who had betrayed him and must be put to death. The daughters of the Emperor finally beheld Van Dyer for what he truly was, a lumpen coward of a man. Pathetic bully, all bravado, pettiness, and base vanity. As he ranted and raved incoherently from his desk about a stolen realm, Dominica strode forth. One woman, standing against the pathetic husk of the would-be ruler, and pronounced upon him a judgment that would change the course of the galaxy. You have committed the ultimate heresy. Not only have you turned your back upon the Emperor and stepped from his light, you have profaned his name and almost destroyed everything he has striven to build. You have perverted and twisted the path he has laid for mankind to tread. As your own decrees have stated, there can be no mercy for such a crime, no pity for such a criminal. I renounce your lordship. You walk in the darkness and cannot be allowed to live. Your sentence has been long overdue, and now it is time for you to die. It is said that Van Dyer was too lunatic to even know his end had come for him, that, as his rambling, incoherent speech flowed from his slack, small mouth, he was heard to have said he did not have enough time to die. Others say he died begging for his life soiling himself in the terror of seeing a power sword held aloft. Whatever the truth, he died that day, and the reign of blood ended with him. The subsequent reformation and reconstruction took longer than the tyrant's rule had, with Sebastian Thor leading the way as the new ecclesiarch. In order to ensure that such a seizure of power could never occur again, not only was the ability to hold two concurrent seats of the High Lords of Terra utterly banned, but the Ministorum itself was forced to relinquish all standing military formations under its direct control. Since its inception in M32, the armies of the faithful had been a powerful asset in the defense of the Imperium, but Van Dyer's coup had demonstrated all too easily the ease at which faith could be hijacked and redirected by one with enough power, influence, and mercilessness. The Ecclesiarchy's armies became those of the Astra Militarum, and its fleets those of the Imperial Navy. But Thor, from his new position, dictated a different fate for the daughters of the Emperor. They would remain under the Church's control, for he did not want the faith to be entirely unarmed. Now it would be led by those who had bathed in the Emperor's own light, to be his sword and his shield and his fiery devotion. The daughters of the Emperor were no more. Now emerged the Adepta Sororitas. Since their inception, the Sisters of Battle have occupied a unique role in the broad, diverse, and diffused apparatus of the Imperial military. With all of its notable branches siloed by fears of power concentration, having a division solely at the behest of the Church of the Emperor raised, initially, much criticism and, to be frank, quite justified concerns in the aftermath of a tyrannical reign of a madman who had owed his power to armies of the faithful. In practice, however, the sisters have proven themselves almost uniquely immune to the strife, politicking, and indeed sedition that can infect other august imperial bodies, 
even the Adeptus Astartes themselves. While in theory they are answerable only to the Ecclesiarch, in reality they heed naught but the word of the Abbess Sanctorum, the woman at the head of the entire organization. The centralization of command into one figure is one of the key aspects that sets the Sororitas apart from the Astartes, who, while occasionally possessing a representative within the Senatorum Imperialis, have never, and very deliberately, possessed anything in a way of a supreme commander. The Sisters are a united and singular organization, but not without its particular balances and checks to prevent just the type of nightmare scenario everyone worries will happen from arising. Sororitas is divided into two great convents, both physical structures in the gigantic fortress cathedrals they are named for, and organizational hierarchy subdivisions. Both convents are vested in a planet each, and both of these planets are considered to be the holiest in the entire Imperium. The Convent Sanctorum is based on the cardinal world of Ophelia VII, while the Convent Prioris is vested upon Holy Terra itself. The convents were a facet of the Thorian reforms intended to quell the fears of his fellow High Lords, as they reflect the division of power within the Ministorum itself and the twin synods of Terra and Ophelia. With both synods and convents monitoring each other for any deviation from faith or doctrine, it has been ensured that the power, both tangible and ephemeral, that the ecclesiarchy may wield is effectively curtailed, that no High Lord may ever attain the degrees of control that Van Dyer had. There exists one more check upon those who would wield the faith of the God Emperor's flock, and these were to emerge in tandem with the Sororitas. Indeed, to have their fates to be almost indelibly linked. The holy ordos of his imperial majesty's inquisition, far from being idle during this period of reformation, had formed, in secret, as is their wont, a new ordo majoris, the ordo hereticus. This new wing of the inquisition was tasked with monitoring the internal affairs of the imperium and its people for the emergence of aberrant strains of faith concentrations of ecclesiastical power, or outright heresy. Everything from the rantings of cultists to the corruption of cardinals falls under its gaze. But it, as a child of the reign of blood, is always perennially watchful over the actions of the Adeptus Ministorum. They scrutinize the wars of faith, ensuring that they are justified and approvably righteous, and carefully oversee the disbanding of holy crusade forces once all objectives are met. They root out the cankers that may fester within a synod to ensure that no would-be Van Dyers may rise above their station, and through an agreement known as the Convocation of Nephilim, they can call upon the forces of the Adepta Sororitas in open battle. That being said, it is unclear as to whether the Sisterhood can be considered a true chamber militant of the Ordo, in the same way that the Adeptus Astartes' Death Watch are for the alien hunters of the Ordo Xenos, for example. Many oft refer to the Sororitas as the chamber militant of the Ecclesiarchy itself, while others, perhaps considering the routine employment of the Sisterhood by hereticus inquisitors, name them as the Ordo's chamber militant. The ambiguity is frustrating, but perhaps understandable, as many within the Imperium underestimate the degree of autonomy the Sisterhood is afforded, while also overestimating the amount of control certain bodies may wield over them. Regardless of the direct hierarchy involved, the Sisters of Battle are routinely to be seen aiding the Witch Hunters of the Inquisition in order to pursue their aims, just as the Ordo Hereticus military forces are often known to provide specialist reinforcements for Sororitas upon the field of battle, should their particular talents be required. From the moment of their founding, the Sisterhood proved to be an incredible new military asset in the Imperium's fold, not only rooting out the last pockets of Van Dyerite loyalists, but also in turning back the predations of those who sought to despoil the Emperor's domain as his subjects had been consumed by strife. In time, their numbers swelled so much that Sebastian Thor's successor, Ecclesiarch Alexis XXII, ordered the convents of Terra and Ophelia to form distinct militant orders from within their structures, all to be led by the maidens who had attended to the Emperor upon that fateful day of Van Dyer's downfall. The convent Prioris, 
formed the Order of the Ebon Chalice, led by Alicia Dominica herself, and the Order of the Argent Shroud, led by Sister Silvana. The Convent Sanctorum formed the Order of the Valorous Heart, led by Sister Lucia, and the Order of the Fiery Heart, led by Alicia's former shield-bearer, Catherine. These four orders led the Sisterhood and its fiery convictions to all corners of the Imperium, establishing new convent and shrine worlds in its far-flung reaches. The four sisters at their vanguards each performed uncanny miracles before the eyes of many, earning their places in legend and being beatified as living saints. As is, however, so oft the case in this galaxy of ours, their legends ended in blood, and all fell as martyrs in the course of their wars. Catherine, being the last to fall to the witch cult of Mensatius, was honored by her order militant, who donned armor of purest black forevermore, now to be known as the Order of Our Martyred Lady. Two more major orders militant were formed to join these four in M38, the Order of the Sacred Rose, based in the Convent Prioris, and the Order of the Bloody Rose, based in the Convent Sanctorum, to honor the last two of Alicia Dominica's companions, Arabella and Mina, respectively. While these six orders have been the largest and most prevalent throughout the millennia of the Sisterhood's history, they have been supplemented by many, many smaller ones, but no less vital, referred to commonly as the Lesser Orders Militant. The Order of the Iron Veil, the Order of the Wounded Heart, the Order of the Ashen Shrine, the Order of the Glowing Chalice, they number in their hundreds, overseeing everything from sector-wide parishes to a single shrine on a backwater world. All, however, fall under the purview of the Adepta Sororitas, and all will respond to whatever call their faith places upon them. The largest of the Order's militant maintain standing armies greater in power than any within the Imperium, save for leading Astra Militarum regiments and chapters of the Adeptus Astartes. Unlike the latter, there is no hard limit placed upon their size. The Sorortas abide by no codex as the Astartes must, for they have throughout their history simply never been proven to need one, so inviolate is their faith. No order has ever turned traitor, as some chapters of the Adeptus Astartes have. These biggest orders hold affiliate sanctuaries throughout the galaxy beyond their administrative parishes, termed preceptories, which additionally, and somewhat oddly, is the term the Sororitas use for their largest organizational group that an order may field at once, numbering around 1,000 sisters, the same as the maximum number of Astartes permitted per chapter under the laws of the Codex Astartes. Subordinate to them are commanderies, both in terms of direct chain of command and real-world presence. Commanderies are typically charged with the protection of more moderate order holdings, such as minor fortresses or cathedral complexes. As with the preceptories, the commanderies are also a term used for the nested organizational unit within the military structure, equivalent in position to a company within an Astartes chapter. Below them is the mission, a squad-level sororitas unit whose term is also utilized by the Order for a group of sisters assigned to achieve a specific short-term objective. The model is prone, as with Astartes chapters, to deviation from that prescribed by the Adepta as a whole, but it is notable that there is far less departure from the standard model than even in a lightly non-Codex-compliant Astartes chapter despite the ostensibly much stricter Lex binding the latter to a prescribed model. Projection of martial power by the Sororitas is limited by one major aspect of their structure, however, and that is their lack of any order-specific fleets. While the Astartes often possess sizable Voidcraft flotillas of their own, albeit limited to specific hull designs, the Sororitas are, only under law, able to possess orbital landing craft, up to and including heavier macro conveyors, but the largest of interstellar transports and any actual military craft are to be contracted from the Navis Imperialis. The service runs of any such destroyers, frigates, and battleships that they may undertake for a specific order can last for millennia, but it is always understood that they are not under the command of the Ecclesiarchy. It is one aspect of the siloing of Imperial military that the Sororitas are not immune from, 
but it is a standard that all who serve under arms for the god emperor are held to. Befitting their role as the elite holy warriors of the Church of the Emperor Deified, the Adeptus Aurortas are arrayed with an armory rivaling any branch of the imperial military for its lethality. When the daughters of the Emperor were impressed under the purview of the Ministorum by Gauge Van Dyer, their primitive, even barbarian arsenal of weaponry and armor were fully upgraded to match their new station, and they were provided with training to match. In a rare honor that no doubt shocked many, the daughters were provided with power armor plate and modified Godwin de Haas pattern bolters, the twin hallmarks of the Adeptus Astartes, and wielded by few others within the Imperium save for ranks within the Inquisition or other specialized attachments. This incredible boon was accomplished by Van Dyer himself, who, through political maneuvering and outright intimidation, signed a treaty with Fabricator General Hediatrix of the Adeptus Mechanicus to arm his new daughters in perpetuity. It has been heavily rumored since that time that Van Dyer allowed certain hitherto unbequeathed freedoms to the Mechanicus regarding their worship of the machine god, and while this cannot be verified at this point, there is certainly eyebrows to be raised at such close cooperation between two historically fraught organizations. The treaty, known as the Writ Illuminant, was later reasserted by Van Dyer's successor Sebastian Thor, and since then by each High Ecclesiarch of the Imperium in turn. The treaty has the dual benefit of erasing Fabricator General Hediatrix's role in Van Dyer's rise to power by recasting the Mechanicus as being instrumental in arming the warriors whose revelations would precipitate the tyrant's downfall. But it also grants the Mechanicum political leverage over a military arm of the Imperium of Terra that would otherwise be completely outside their influence on account of the disparities inherent between the twin fates of the twin empires. The relationship of the cult of the Emperor and the cult of the Omnissiah has ever been an aspect of the sister planet's histories most prefer to simply ignore, lest uncomfortable questions about the exact nature of the machine god be asked. The writ illuminant grants both leeway to the Mechanicus from the scrutiny of the Imperium's most devout elements, as well as granting them a very visible role in arming the holiest of the Imperium's warriors. While the Order's militant are the most visible members of the Sororitas, and most commonly lionized in Imperial propaganda networks, they are not the only aspect of the Adepta. Operating alongside their sisters, but in far less martial roles, are the non-militant Orders that have refined and carried forward the traditions of the Daughters of the Emperor through the march of history. The Order's Hospitaller are probably the most well-known, being common sights upon the battlefields of the Imperium galaxy-wide, tending to the wounded or providing them with the Emperor's final benediction. To the Sisters of the Hospitaller, to tend to the sick and the dying is the purest expression of their faith, knowing that their skills lie more in healing than they do in warfare. The Orders grant their services to every single branch of the Imperial military, save for the Adept Astartes, and as surgeons and physicians, they are often regarded as truly sacred by the combatants of whatever war zone they win, and often with good reason. The Order's Hospitaller have seen many of their number canonized by the Ministorum, owing to the miraculous feats of healing they have performed, their faith manifesting in the Materium to save those who fell fighting in the name of He upon the throne. Outside of their campaigns, the Orders maintain vast librariums containing a trove of medical knowledge, not only on human physiology, but treaties upon the nature of the many esoteric, heretical, and arcane armaments that the soldiery of the Imperium will often find deployed against them. Not content with being simple healers, the Hospitaller are proactive, maintaining detailed records on just how to best mitigate the weaponry of the enemy drawn from both official reports and from the personal journals of sisters involved in the treatments of the wounded by, say, a Necron Gauss Flare or a Tau Plasma Rifle. This expertise is often applied to deadly effect upon the battlefield itself, with the Hospitaller sisters providing physiological knowledge of the enemy to their order's militant divisions. Indeed, this is not the end of their consultancy practices within the Imperium. 
as ecclesiarchal confessors will routinely elicit their medical skills in order to prolong the lives of suspected heretics who are undergoing extra-normal interrogation procedures. These sisters are true masters of their craft, going so far as to reattach severed limbs or to allow a patient to slip into death before resuscitation is granted multiple times in a single session. All so that the truth, or even a mere repentance, can be extracted. No less present abroad across the galaxy, though far less of a folk hero aspect than the Hospitaller, the Order's Famulus are in effect a sort of specialized administratum within the Sisterhood, responsible for the diplomatic endeavors conducted between the various branches of the Imperium and its noble houses. The aristocracy of the Empire is many and varied, and beholden to a web of feudal loyalties, commercial agreements, and ancient legalities that is truly impossible to fully grasp in its scope. It does, however, play a vital role in the functioning of the Imperium, and the families of the houses wield tremendous power over the day-to-day -day affairs of the Emperor's realm, enough that they are the sole concern of the Order's Famulus, who serve these houses as chamberlains, viziers, magistrates, and emissaries. The role is entirely and deeply political, and the sisters to whom this position falls are always the canniest of diplomatic operators that can be mustered. Imperial politicking is nothing if not rampantly cutthroat, and despite their holiness, faith, and goodwill, these are poor protections against an aristocrat who should believe your removal would be to their benefit. That being said, there is substantial goodwill to be gained for the noble houses that employ or acquiesce to the presence of the sororitas within their courts, not least for the public displays of faith and fealty to the god-emperor that it allows them to make. It is, of course, facetious of me to suggest that the sisters of the Ordo's Famulus be seen in such base terms. There are many within the imperial nobility who are faithful to a fault, and the Famulus sisters minister to these individuals stoking the fires of their faith and providing sage guidance on how best the power of these houses can be used for the betterment of the god-emperor's flock and the protection of his borders. They will often use their influence and connections for the forging of better trade deals, mutual defense clauses, and arranged marriages, all in the name of ensuring that the most powerful and useful of Terra's subject families remain so. This does, as I suspect some of you may have guessed, come with a great boon, and one that forms the other side of the coin, as far as the Famulus' roles are concerned. They are the Sororitas' intelligence arm, their eyes in every major noble household, monitoring the great and good of the Imperium for deviation from the tenets of the faith. Should evidence of any treachery or heresy be ascertained, the words of the Famulus sisters can bring everything from the Ministorum's confessors to the full might of an order militant down upon the heads of those she had until then served at the behest of. Sundry thousands of cults have thus been rooted out, purged from existence before their terrible plans come to deadly fruition, and the lands of the noble families that they once sprung from salted and erased from history. These two are but two examples of the breadth of the Order's non-militant. Many others serve the Sororitas and the Ecclesiarchy in far more granular and specialized roles rarely perceived by the wider Imperium. The Ordo Fenestras, for example, is a single order within the Sisterhood whose sole responsibility it is to preserve and maintain the sacred illuminated glass of the Imperium's most holy of holy sites. Small detachments of the Order's Sabine ply the dark warp corridors at the very edge of humanity's sphere, pushing forth into the frontiers of the Imperium to bring the Emperor's illumination to the furthest corners of his realm, where the Astronomicon is but the suggestion of dawn over the proverbial horizon. The Order's Vespila sanctify the bodies of their fallen sisters, ensuring their mortal shells will be preserved forevermore so that future generations may know of their deeds through contemplation of their earthly remains. The Order's Mandriga and the Order's Plancilium fulfill similar roles to each other, providing all-female choirs for the Imperium's cathedrals and supervising processional ceremonies, respectively. Finally, 
The Order's Pronatus form a sort of archival department within the Sororitas and the Ecclesiarchy, tasking themselves with the retrieval, study, and cataloging of tens of thousands of holy relics under the Ministorum's purview. Archivistic pursuits are naturally close to my heart, and one can imagine that such a task is as monumental as it is no doubt frustrating and often thankless. The sisters of the Pronatus Orders will often spend decades pursuing leads of a lost artifact, owing to be ultimately frustrated. It is a testament to their will and to their faith that they persist. A far more recognizable aspect to the wider Imperium is with their role as sanctifiers, for it is to these sisters that the charge of purging potentially corrupted Imperial relics will fall. One of these orders was responsible for the consecration of the chapter banner of the Adeptus Astartes Lamenters, following that chapter's participation, for want of a better word, in the Badab War. And in the darkest times following the Noctus Aeterna, the Pronatus are more needed than ever, resanctifying the sundry artifacts and holy weapons lost to the Great Rift and only recently recovered during the Indomitus Crusade. Across the tenuous stability of Imperium Sanctus, to the dreadful, occluded paths of Imperium Nihilus, the Sisters of Battle continue to fight against the tides of the Emperor's enemies. While some amongst our race have seen the coming of the Great Rift as a sign of the end times, the Sisterhood have only been emboldened. To the Sororitas, the Kikatrix Maledictum is a portent of faithlessness, of straying from the holy path he has set forth for us, and thus an opportunity for even greater displays of devotion and even more strident wars of faith. The paths of righteous reclamation is clear to them, and in these pitiless times, their light is needed now more than ever. We can but be grateful for them, yearn to be more akin to their nobility and selflessness, and we can but pray that we ourselves may never be so desperate as to require the aid of a battle sister and her bolter. Ave, Imperator. Gloria, in excelsis terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash oculusimperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.